even within the art furniture market, a lot of the things that people make can be reproduced. And so I think kind of gotten in the habit of finding ways to make objects that like not even reproducible. It's like a trick. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Devers and this is Clever. Today I'm talking to fine artist and designer Misha Khan. Misha was born and raised in Duluth, Minnesota and grew up with almost unlimited freedom to explore the wild surroundings, as well as his wild interior world and creative impulses. He studied furniture design at Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, and after earning his BFA, he landed in New York City, where he promptly started gaining attention in the art world. Operating at the intersection of design and sculpture, he's known for his playful, irreverent designs, immersive environments, and experimental techniques and materials, like concrete, aluminum, paint, resin, hand-blown glass, and even grass. You'll definitely want to look up his work, mishakan.com, that's M-I-S-H-K-A-H-N.com, to see what I'm talking about. At the young age of 30, he's already mounted several exhibitions that have cemented his reputation as one of the most provocative and exciting voices in contemporary design today. As of the recording of this conversation, he was deep in the creation of new work for a solo show at Friedman Benda in New York City. And you'll get to hear all about that from Misha himself. My name's Misha Khan, and I make very eccentric furniture objects and I wish I knew why I was motivated to do it. I love that that furniture is this thing that is sort of the same size as us, like it's basically another human and that it's something we take home and that it's something we keep for our whole lives usually if it's nice. I love that you're still solving the mystery of of why you're doing it, but you're barreling, you know, full force ahead anyway. (laughs) A, a source of constant daily turmoil. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, let's go back all the way to the beginning. I, I always love to hear the origin story. I understand you were born and raised in Duluth, Minnesota? Yes, from Duluth, Minnesota, which is a, a sort of small city way up north. It's very cold and woodsy, but it's also really sort of liberal hippie town. And I feel like there's lots of creative people around. So It was definitely a creative environment. What was your family like? My mom is a writer, and she writes kids' books and and young adult books. And my dad uh, runs a construction company. And I always sort of feel like I just lazily ended up in the middle, building things, but building things that kind of also tell a story and make a, a world. Yeah, you are a nice composite of the two of them, it sounds like. Did you have yeah. brothers and sisters? Yeah, I have one older brother, and he lives in Duluth and coaches cross-country skiing and works with my dad. So how were you manifesting your creativity in your youth and adolescence? Like, what kind of kid were you, and what fascinated you? Well, I was always making things, and as a kid, I was making things and also very entrepreneurial. Like, there was always a hustle. Mm -hmm. Um, so there was like a lot of these really elaborate gambling games, like sort of pachinko-esque things that I would try and get lure people into playing when they would come over. And I had a caramel roll business where I would deliver them by boat one summer. And Wait, what? (laughs) Elaborate, please. Um, people would, I got an answering machine and people would phone in and if they wanted caramel rolls the next day. And then my cousin, I think I wasn't old enough to drive the boat. So my cousin would drive me around in the boat and I would deliver the caramel rolls. Like sticky buns. Is that what the rest of the country calls them? Were you baking them? Yeah, yeah. Very into And then I'm guessing you lived on a lake? We end the summers, yeah. um, Okay, I love this. (laughs) What kind of packaging did you make for these? The same as it is now. Just like things sort of casually wrapped in tinfoil, regardless of what they are. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah that's reminiscent of your current artwork <laughs> <laughs> zero evolution has taken place well i'm not surprised to hear that you were always making stuff and that you had kind of an entrepreneurial hustle going on that just seems just to, to fit with what i've read about you 
did that go over well with your family? Did like, did you get support and encouragement for that or were they? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, everyone <laughs> has always been probably overly indulgent of my creative whims. <laughs> um, and then I think obviously once you're trying to do it in a more real way in the real world, you start getting all this sort of criticism and pushback and, and having to make things real. That then is the, the challenging part, I guess. That's the parenting dilemma, right? Is do we give our child all of this permission and then they face a harsh reality? Or do we make our child face the harsh reality and curb their enthusiasm for life? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I don't. And I don't know the answer. I feel like it's always the same, like dating people. Like, should I hide some aspects of myself for a while so that they're not like, maybe I can ease them in? I think it's always like that. <laughs> right. Or, or which, which aspects of myself are going to like seal the deal and then I can reveal the other ones that might be <laughs> yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hustling and making things always. How did the teenage years look for you? Because frequently those are just turbulent times. There's a lot of growth going on. There's a lot of identity stuff happening. If there is resistance from your parents, that usually comes to a head, but it sounds like you guys were kind of all on the same page, which is really nice. But what did the teenagers look like for you? Well, I kept myself so insanely busy. I was always doing two sports at the same time. And I was at that point really into making clothes. I moved up to the top of the attic of our house and had a big sewing studio and would just spend all my other time making clothing. And I feel like my life in weird transitions has always included a year of rest and relaxation, which in my teen years was when I was 16, I did a year in Belgium. And I was probably the most delinquent student. I just rarely went to class. What were you doing instead? Well, I got into this community art class. So I would go there and do clay sculpting. I would go to museums and watch a ton of movies. It was my first time being in a big city like that. And Brussels has so much weird stuff, but also culture. And I just sort of like was guzzling it. And so I think that was like a very formative thing when I kind of realized I wanted to, to actually pursue something creative in, in that mm -hmm. way because I think I hadn't really seen that kind of work before I don't it sounds so obvious but I guess when you're in a small town you don't really think about all the different avenues like what all the possibilities right well it's hard world. to see until you've been up against it face to face um did you did you travel a lot as a youth yeah but i my parents are so are so my whole family is very outdoorsy and sporty and so i feel like the usual the trips were lots of like hut to hut hiking in norway or like yeah you got the nature Pacifica. adventures yeah yeah which is great i just still love but yeah i think this was like a very eye-opening experience for for art we went on a lot of vacations too but they were always to cities and museums and you know, historic ruins and things like that. And so it's when people want to take me camping, I'm like, sure, but I don't know what to do. <laughs> I don't know how to do this. I never did this. I feel kind of the opposite. So I <laughs> yeah. just live in a city now and I'm like, what are you supposed to, like on days off, it's like, what are you supposed to do here? <laughs> do you feel like you got a, a little bit of both then? That's, so that's kind of nice. You got the nature and the, and the city. Yeah, yeah. You need both. Is it your curiosity that led you to do that year in Brussels? Well, our house, we were just always taking in exchange student stragglers. So oh. growing up, it was just always exchange students around. So I think it oh. seemed very That's obvious cool. to me. Yeah. Do you still have friends that lived with you when you were a kid? Yeah, I think we're all going to Greece for one of our foreign exchange students' weddings this spring. Oh, my gosh. That's Everyone's amazing. Like, that was when you were 12 and you still keep in touch. It was like somehow, Yes. <laughs> so when you came back you felt pretty assured that you were going to pursue something creative um is that when you started uh, making plans to go to college yeah and then I, I was still like I don't know it had very it been kind of drilled in my head not to go to like real call quote unquote real college even then I, I kind of started doing putting together a portfolio and thinking about going to art schools but it wasn't 
was a very like last ditch decision. So when your parents were were enforcing this idea of real college, this is something I'm really interested in because they're both creatives, but they still are not thinking of the creative field as real or or what? No, I don't. I actually don't think it was them at all. I think I, I went to a little private school in Duluth, and it was just very you know math and science and and tech. Okay. Yeah, and it was just that that was like the environment, and it was very sort of competitive about which school you would try and go to. And and so did you always feel like you had full support from your parents to kind of go do whatever felt right to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So what were you considering other than art? Can you even imagine yourself in that parallel reality? No, not really, <laughs> except for some time. Like the first year I kind of went into this this program at, at MCAD before I, I transferred to RISD and it was a Bachelor of Science degree it was very like marketing and, and sort of advertising and kind of interfacing creative projects with the sort of business side. Weirdly, you know, 10 years after school or something, I feel like that is my, a lot of my day is, is kind of the part that there is a big part that's not that creative where you have to kind oh, yeah. of, uh, like today it's called, like figuring out what, how to get these things to clear customs and, you know, stuff like that. I, ironically, I feel like I did sort of end up or, or having a career as like ending up halfway between being creative and, and trying to be some kind of business also. And just if you had pursued something other than art, I think you'd be a pretty good mad scientist, don't you? I also think I might still be a plastic surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe yes. I am a plastic surgeon and I just haven't gotten the opportunity yet (laughs) but I'm like isn't that exactly the same it's just like involves like one extra step which is like slicing the skin and then it's the same as everything else I'm doing right right I think so (laughs) you could be so creative (laughs) okay so you did decide to go to RISD did you know you were going to study furniture design because you got your your BFA in furniture design from RISD correct yeah I did I had taken a furniture class and so the reason I applied for furniture was just I thought I could get in um Mm. and then I immediately planned on transferring into apparel oh right because you had been sewing garments already yeah and I just never did it's funny looking back now and you're like, well, I can't like I can't imagine myself in a, making clothes. And it, obviously living in New York, I know lots of people who are who do fashion and clothing. Yeah, it's, it's such a different world. It's a different world. But it seems to me that both of those um, have a very direct relationship with a human user. And that seems like it might be something that appeals to you. Totally. No, I think from a creative and artistic standpoint, they're basically the same. It's about mm-hmm. like personal style and sense of escape and your body and that scale and craft. Yeah. And then it, it just like so happens that there's two different markets and then the market builds this whole other thing around it. Well, what were your years like at RISD? What particular flavor of mind expansion did you go through? I don't know. I mean, I think I'm such a contrarian and RISD, in a way, like in the teaching and this, the way the school is set up is a, is a very traditional education. And so you kind of learn by doing, but also in this specific way of building like really like a formal, proper skill set, which for furniture design was very much this process of, of designing it in the sense of drawing something on paper and then organizing how it would be made and then going through the steps to produce it also very much about like making a cohesive object something that people could see in the end and kind of understand uh, what the object was trying to do and communicate so it's hard to know if it's just like so arbitrary that because that's what the teaching is I had to push against it (laughs) you're going to no matter what (laughs) yeah yeah like if it would have been a free-for-all I probably would have just like I would probably be like a very traditional woodworker just out of spite (laughs) <laughs> um, so I think that in a, in a lot of ways after school, I think I went through a process of figuring out how I wanted to make things and, and what worked for me and sort of mm-hmm. abandoning a lot of those rules to kind of find a, a way that worked a bit better for me. 
I went to RISD too, so full disclosure, um, I felt like it was almost hard to be a rebel there just because everything was accepted in a way, like the, your artistic expression was, as long as you had a justification for it or or you could defend your ideas, it was fully embraced. And so like the act of rebellion wasn't it so much. I, it, it For me, it morphed from rebelling against something into really deeply finding my own voice. I think that's true. I guess that, I mean, the part that I'm also referring to, I, th- I think like within the field of aesthetic, like people were so open-minded and it mm-hmm. certainly was not, I never felt like I was being pushed to create a certain aesthetic of work, which is so cool that, that they're able to do that. I, I did think that in terms of process and how you would develop your ideas and then manifest them, there was mm-hmm. a pretty strong, and for furniture design, a pretty strong method that, that was taught. And then it, I think it took me a minute to realize that there was, that that wasn't the only way. So we're going to get into your process for sure, because it's fascinating. I'm guessing you, you found the beginnings of it, at least while you were in school, I mean, by the time you graduated, did you feel like you had found your voice and your method? Yeah. I mean, I think in in certain ways, yes. Um, I mean, obviously it's continually evolving, except for that you're still wrapping things in tinfoil. Like. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it was also funny retracing steps like this because you start pulling out these threads and realizing how arbitrary your entire life might be. Um, but there was this one bank building, the the furniture department had just gotten this new space above the, the 3d store. And it was this big open room that was sort of on the upper level of this old bank. And it was just a really cool room to hang out in and they didn't really have any tools in it. So almost no one would use it. And me and a few friends kind of just made that our studio. And because of that, I feel like I was just always making things that didn't require all the traditional tools that everyone else was crowding around. So it had so much to do with like, which it still kind of does for me. It was like, okay, well, this works better for my lifestyle. If I just, you know, if I don't make things out of wood or everything's not sort of properly made out of metal, then I can hang out in this cuter room. Um, (laughs) And that was like definitely a big part of it. Oh, I, okay. So this might be far fetched, but what I'm picking up from your youth is that you had sort of a natural gift for assimilating into your surroundings. For instance, if your caramel rolls needed to be delivered, but you couldn't drive the boat, you figured out a way to drive the boat. You knew how to navigate your natural environment. And then it sounds like that may even be kind of a driving force in your life because navigating your natural environment at RISD also informed your process in a way. Yeah, no, I think that that's true. And definitely, you know, in working with other fabricators now, I feel like that's always a part of it, sort of seeing how they're working and and how things can be made and then just kind of going with that flow. Yeah. So let's talk about post-graduation. It's always, I think, really interesting to understand how you got your first few steps in your professional career, because there is sort of a safety in being a student where your primary job is to express yourself and figure out how to express yourself. But after graduation, there's a there's a big shift and you got to figure out how to make a living and also establish yourself in your chosen career. So what did that look like for you? Right after school, I got a Fulbright. So I got another year of rest and relaxation. um, (laughs) Congratulations. (laughs) That's a big deal. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It was a very like cute way to hang out for a year. And I went to Tel Aviv and I didn't do too much, but I made some shoes and spent a lot more time sewing, which was very useful for the kind of first work that I started making after school. Then I I sort of moved to New York very haphazardly. I just, I had gotten back and I didn't really know where to go. I have friends here. It used to be that RISD would just sort of be an exodus to Brooklyn after graduation. And so I had lots of friends Mm -hmm. here and it seemed like there was, you know, like a few jobs floating around. So I just moved here, not, not expecting to stay. 
my first job I got off of Craigslist was just building these little animatronic parts for for like Christmas displays, like the Macy's windows and other places. And I don't know, it's, I don't, it's hard to really understand how something snowballs exactly, but I started making these concrete things first. So I was sewing bags that were very strange shapes out of vinyl and, and just filling them with concrete. And they were these really lumpy, squishy, bizarre forms. Fairly simple now, I think. But at the time, everyone was kind of, it felt like there was, it was sort of post-recession and there was like a heritage vibe that just cut through everything and everything kind of looked like it was old and classic and handmade in the proper sense and refined I suppose but really natural Mm. materials and I feel like people were kind of starved for something that was out of left field and colorful and plastic and jarring (laughs) I yeah I see what you're saying and I I think I know the pieces that you're talking about and what's really delightful about them too is they have the form of an inflatable, like a sewn vinyl piece, but they have the weight and the density of concrete. Yeah. And I think the weight on those two, like makes them look really anthropomorphic in a way, because the folds are so fatty and they kind of look like they're like barely supporting themselves, which when they're cat, when they're setting, like is the case, like I'm just sort of like stringing them up precariously. Yeah. And so that was kind of the first stuff I started making and I mean again so much of it had to do with I I didn't really have enough space to make real molds so sewing these little bags that would pack down into a tiny space was just like a a practical thing almost. And were these one of a kind like were the molds one-offs or could you reuse them and make multiples? No they're one-offs because yeah you, you have to peel the you have to destroy the mold to open them up which I, I don't, certainly wasn't doing in a cognizant way, but has later proved to be, I think coming up with ways to make individual objects has been really useful because people value them in a, a slightly different way. Mm-hmm. We, we were talking about the difference in the fashion market and the art furniture market. Um, there's also a very different market for regular furniture versus one of a kind art furniture. Yeah. Well, Um, I think even within the art furniture market, a lot of the things that people make can be reproduced. mm -hmm. Um, And so I think I've, I've kind of gotten in the habit of finding ways to make objects that, that just are made in ways that like results in something that's fully one of a, you know, like, like not even reproducible. It's like a trick. So these forms, which were decidedly different from what was coming out at the time, that were not necessarily characterized by natural materials and refined aesthetics, but had this sort of counterintuitive formal language that and bright colors. You're, you're saying this is what got you some recognition and things started to snowball from there? Yeah, I mean, I would just am still shocked that anyone wanted those things. But it was kind of like what what sort of happened was like, yeah, like a few friends had little shows and I had some pieces out there and then and people wanted to buy them, which was crazy. And then I, I got into like a first little gallery and and very shortly after in this way that I feel like only happens in New York the Museum of Art and Design was having a a biennial and they just wanted to showcase people who are making things in New York. And somehow they had stumbled across my things, which at this point I hadn't been making for very long. And so I got to be in this show and it was a bit of a lucky break because there was a hundred people in the show, but I think I was the last person that they'd met with to, to find a place to put, put my thing in the museum. And the curator, who's this very young, silly guy, just let me take all the space that was left, which were these really like nonsensical parts of the museum, like those, the area around the elevator or where the lobby benches were or the floor underneath some other sculptures. And so I just kind of took as much real estate as I possibly could have and kind of took over. <laughs> this sounds very like you, assessing the natural environment and finding 
how you can how and where you can fit in yeah yeah it's funny when you say it like that and you're like i guess that is true and quite logical but i definitely never <laughs> saw it that way it was just like well like this is the situation so this is what we're doing so did you make new work for that show yeah it was all new work and i can't i can't even wrap my head around how it happened now because i think i got like fifteen hundred dollars to produce all the work for the show which i'm sure at the time was all the money i had um, mm -hmm. so everything had to be made very craftily. I remember delivering it all in my geo tracker at the time. <laughs> it's like, it's like pre art handler days, but yeah, it was a, it was a real turning point for me because then I got a lot of mileage out of that show. I'm sure that's, that's fantastic. Did you feel like it sort of elevated you to the next, let's say plateau. And from there you were kind of off to the races. Yeah, um, about a month in, I got an email from Mark Benda, who runs Friedman Benda, saying that he he wanted to set up a meeting with me. And mm -hmm. I didn't really know what it was about or what to expect. And at the time, th they were not a gallery that was showing any 22-year-olds. So it didn't seem like a reasonable likelihood. And But yeah, it was quite a, a game changer to go from a little total ragamuffin to all of a sudden having a, a big well-staffed gallery supporting your idiotic whims. Yeah, yes. And it sounds like you're not taking it for granted. <laughs> because that is kind of a big deal. And in the in the art and musician world, there's always this kind of idea that you're willing to work as hard as it takes, but you've really made it when there's somebody else to load in your drums or to load in your, your art and hang it for you. And so it sounds like you've graduated to art handler status now. Sort of. It's ever, I'm also like preparing for the show that opens in 10 days and I'm like missing all these deadlines and like, I'll just drive it over in my car. It's fine. Yeah. Like, yeah. I know how to do this. Um, <laughs> It'll just be easier if I do it because I've done yeah, it before. Yeah. And I can't I'll just explain. do it. Yeah, yeah. I don't have time to answer this email. I'll just do it. I think it's always a bit of both. Yes. <laughs> well, what can you tell us about the show? What you're making or what kind of direction you're headed in or what kind of themes you're dealing with? Well, the last show there, there was a lot of stuff that was kind of made out of scraps and it felt like this very sort of bohemian world that was like woven together with bits and pieces of things. I think this show is kind of seeing some similar attitudes of weaving these parts together, but I'm I'm sort of producing all of the the elements. And so there's a lot of different media that's kind of combined together. There's several pieces in the show that I, I sculpted in virtual reality and then are fabricated in some capacity. So some of them, there's a few bronze pieces and then a, a tapestry. Mm -hmm. And it's such a specific, it was such a funny thing, like seeing that new technology that I felt like computers had always made this look that didn't relate to me. And then all of a sudden mm -hmm. seeing this like kids program that's meant for like kids to doodle monsters in could so quickly produce these things that felt like they were from the world I was trying to build. So I think the show also has a funny relationship where some things are made that way and then the other things have, have a very clear relationship with them, but they're totally these handmade objects. Is this in your mind? Is this also kind of a, a weaving together of sort of historical references and craft with digital technology and dystopian future ideas? This show, I think, is not dystopian at all. I think it's super okay. like this idea that us and computers and the material surroundings can all like we all understand each other. Like it feels like each of the components is super empathetic and interested in mimicking each other. Oh, um, interesting. I, I definitely d didn't feel any like negative undertones about anything going on. It was kind of like the answer is using all of it all at once and just feeling positive about using everything. Do you feel personally just in your general vibe? Do you feel like when you're working on something that's dealing with empathy, you know, themes of empathy and harmony, do you feel different inside than when you're working on themes of ecological decline? Totally. I mean, I think part of that is true. I, I also, like the last show, I feel like 
was me designing objects for like the renaissance the post-apocalypse renaissance like <laughs> like what will we be left there like, will be no technology and we will just have trash like all this like refuse and how mm-hmm. are we gonna start like what is the what are the palaces of post-apocalyptic tomorrow gonna look like and mm-hmm. that was kind of the headspace i was in because if you look at all the information you're like this is what is gonna happen but i also feel like as a as a designer i suppose like if i'm responsible for visualizing the future and that's all i can put out then like i'm just not helping and i also kind of feel like collectively humans love we love destruction and we love seeing destruction and doing it like people all go to watch a bridge get blown up and it is so fun to watch um Mm -hmm. and i think we've played these like negative tapes about the sort of turmoil that awaits us with the climate and all of our sort of ecological horrors that we've put into place. But I also think that when so many people are visualizing something, then it just manifests. So it's kind of like seeing if we could collectively visualize something else. I think that's such a fascinating and valuable perspective because I agree with you 100%. If we keep imagining apocalyptic scenarios, then we're going to manifest it collectively. But as designers, as people who have made it our job to bring things into the world that don't exist yet, that for the pure purpose of imagining a different reality or or something that hasn't been imagined yet, bringing it into three dimensions so that we can all talk about it. It's such a meaningful distinction for you to to actively pursue what what is the other narrative? What is the narrative of the future where everything works in harmony or where things understand each other um, in terms of material, in terms of use, in terms of ecosystem Well, I think that there's so many aspects. One that I feel like I'm trying to address is I think when we produce objects that use regular uniform parts, we visualize this system of infinity. Like when we're making bricks that all look the same, it just feels Mm -hmm. like we can just keep making them forever because we've seen so many that look the same. Like there must be so many more. And part of that also is then these like huge grand systems of quote unquote efficiency where we ship these uniform things all over the world that don't really make sense anywhere else but the random part of earth that they were in to begin with. Like the first little Jenga piece in like a terrible system. Whereas I think if we use materials in a really intuitive way like building in a way that just makes sense for humans to logically use their hands um, and use the materials that are near us, then that would be a big positive step in the right direction. And I also just think from a standpoint of architecture, we've made, we've built a material culture that enforces an idea of, of regular and systems of logic that then I think makes all of us feel uncomfortable because we're weird little emotional creatures. But then everything around us seems like organized rectilinear buildings. And I think we push against that a lot. So we feel, I just think it provides a lot of cultural anxiety that could be alleviated. Hence the title of your show, which is Soft Bodies, Hard Spaces. Yeah. I'm thinking even just in this format right now, we're podcasting and sound comes out of my voice and then bounces all around this rectilinear space that I'm in. And I need to treat it with soft materials in order to manage that sound bouncing around. And in some ways, that's what we're doing with our homes too. We're carpeting and curtains and upholstered furniture to make it soft so it feels comfy and inhabitable. But we're not really addressing it on an urban scale in any way. Yeah, like how do we make this whole environment less harsh for us? Yeah, and why did cinder blocks become, I mean, obviously I know why they became such a powerful building tool. It's because they're uniform and you can, you know, standardize and systemize. But I agree with you that like after a while, there is no humanity in the order. 
we just have to like totally rethink how we build things. I agree. It's like the the whole the architecture should be soft to begin with. Like you should feel comfortable at home without needing anything. So instead, it's my job to put a band aid on architecture. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it seems so obvious to sort of start fixing some of these issues, and and I I don't certainly don't have many of the answers. It's not necessarily about fixing the issues. It's it's doing what you're doing, which is thinking about them in a new way and making, visualizing that into three dimensions um, so that it can be talked about and other people can start to think about it and perhaps visualize it in a new way. Yeah. Your rise, your professional rise has been um, pretty steady and some would say meteoric from the Fulbright right after graduation to um, getting in that show at the Museum of Art and Design to being named one of Forbes 30 under 30 and, you know, now being represented by Friedman Benda. It's pretty exciting. Um, Has it ever felt to you like too much too fast? Or are you able to be self-aware enough to understand what what maybe your particular skills and attitudes are that have helped you navigate this rise, but also instigate it? Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like I have so many ideas. I I always want to get out that I've never felt like I've always just wanted more things, which I think is the unhealthy side of that part is, is just getting so addicted to wanting the next thing and wanting the bigger show and then trying to balance that with, with if you're not grounded enough to sort of spend enough time on one piece to make it special, then there was like no point to all of it. So I think that that's been the, definitely the challenge for me um, in it all is to sort of stay connected enough. Well, I mean, your aesthetic has been called maximalism, um, both uh, in the way that you've decorated your own home, but also um, with regard to your work. And it sounds like you live your life in a sort of maximalist kind of way. But the trick is making that quantity also quality otherwise yeah, it's not yeah. meaningful yeah otherwise it's just a garbage pile <laughs> <laughs> yeah so then what's that look like for you personally is that like you wrestling a short attention span is that you having to like peel back layers and remind yourself of what what your values are what is what does that feel like in a very well, human context I mean, I feel like when I was first getting started, it was like anytime someone offered you an opportunity or a project that you just say yes, because it's so exciting to get it. And now Mm -hmm. I think realizing that like, if I look at my sketchbook, there just won't ever be enough time to make everything in it. And something might be a good idea, but you have to just ignore it because it's going to take away from the other thing. Um, Mm -hmm. And sort of, trying to choose which projects to do to make the most out of, you know, each year. And I, that's definitely, I, I feel like my impulse is just to like try and do it as much as possible all the time. And so I've been trying to kind of focus in on a, on a few things and, and do them better, which is like advice that everyone always gives you. But if it's not your impulse, it's very hard to take. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it sounds like you might be due for another year of rest and relaxation. I How long has it been? I don't get one soon, but I <laughs> oh, crave no. it. I deeply crave it. I actually feel like coming into this show, I kind of, maybe two years ago, I feel like I'd gotten to this place where I was like, well, this is it. I'm at a big gallery and I've got a bunch of edition stuff at Foundries that seems to be selling. And I just was really having a very chill time. Um, mm-hmm. And then I feel like coming into this year, I decided to move studios so we could do so much more stuff ourselves. Um, and it's just been insane hours and, and physical work and, um, and taking a lot of focus. So I do feel like every few years I seem to weasel in a little bit of idle repose. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I'm not due for a while. Oh, I hope you get it because I do think part of the trouble that we're all in in society is that we do more and too fast and a little bit of idle repose is good for everyone. 
um, taken pretty regularly, I think. Yeah, yeah. A little bit every day. <laughs> so let's let's get into your creative process because it looks fun and nutty and playful and it looks kind of willy-nilly, but then I, I know enough about materials and how things go together that some of it has to be actually really meticulously planned and fabricated. And man, you don't stick to one material. So your curiosity sort of travels the globe in terms of all the textures and colors and um, yeah, materiality I, that you include in your in your visual language. What's your process like? I mean, what's it like in your brain? <laughs> I, I don't know. It's clearly a little haphazard and reckless. Um, <laughs> th there's definitely the sensibility that I just kind of keep applying to everything. Usually, like, how can I make this process casual? But then there is a lot of mixing the materials. And when you wander into a forest, what's so nice about it is how many different things there are. Um, so different types of materials and different textures. And, and I always want to build that kind of a lush space. So mm -hmm. I feel like I've gotten, just for what I kind of imagine things feeling like, which has a certain level of variety and eclecticism through those materials and, and different touches, I'm always trying to use a lot of different things. But I also think that's full creative ADD, like, get frustrated with one thing that's clay and then go make it out of glass and then like get frustrated with how the glass isn't doing it the way you want to and then try and make it out of metal. So I think there's definitely like a constant swimming through things to try and find the right option. Well, and you say casual, but the minute you start mixing materials, it, it can't really be super spontaneous because you can't develop a, a rhythm the materials just behave so differently, meaning that like once you discover a rhythm with one material and you want to incorporate another one, it sort of, you got in a different vehicle altogether. Yeah. But is that part of the excitement? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I do know what you mean. I feel like anytime you start mixing materials, like the amount of time that the piece is going to take just skyrockets. Um, mm -hmm. Like there's things to keep track of. There's stuff that doesn't want to stay together. There's just more, if you were going to weld it all together, but now there's glass on it, all of a sudden you right, can't, you can't weld it. Right, you can't weld the glass, and you also can't, like, you can drill through it, but not necessarily. Maybe yeah, adhesives so, have to be added in now, and you got to think about that in terms of where you're welding. Like, yeah, just get... So it's, it certainly does make things more laborious, but at the same time, I feel like I, by using a bigger variety of materials and the challenges that come with it, there's less and less things out there that are made that way. Cause especially historically people were such specialists. So if something mm -hmm. was going to be metal, it was just going to be metal or, and the same thing with glass and, and especially all of the, the sort of craft media that I love. So by mixing them all, it's kind of like a freebie for getting to a place that feels new. And then all of that is in your repertoire, too, in terms of, well, every new material or every new combination of materials just sort of adds to your database of what you can do or how you can do it. I, I love the way you described the diversity of materials sort of being like the biodiversity of a forest, because it does feel very lush. That's one of the things that's so exciting about your work and so atypical is that it feels lush in the same way that um, if you zoom in on nature, you're going to find you can't zoom in so much that, that nature disappears. Like you no, I you'll always find a micro yeah, like, smaller. There's like a patch of lichen with like an even tinier bug. And then like, yeah, yeah it just yeah. keeps going and going and going. And I always think yeah. about that, like how psychotic that is. Like the level of detail <laughs> of nature is so insane. No, it feels like a good contest for us as humans to try and manifest that visually somehow ourselves. How do your pieces come together in terms, like in a very logistical sense? Like you said you just moved studios so that you could do a lot more in-house. How big is your team? What does collaboration look like when you do outsource? What kinds of outsourcing do you do? 
I have six full-time people right now and the new studio we have a lot of we welding equipment and we're doing some metal casting ourselves and ceramic kiln and lots of sewing stuff and, and painting areas um, as well as all the, the sort of resin things um, so we can do a lot here there is a lot of outsourcing as well like the a lot of the large cast metal pieces get done at various foundries depending on what type of object it is there's kind of different ones that i think do a better job at different types of pieces the weaving stuff all, that all gets done by a, a group called gone rural in swaziland yeah i was going to ask you about that what's that relationship like well i just love them i don't know i i it's, it's always sort of been like exploring and then meeting these people where you can tell that you're on the same page like you're not trying to have to cajole them into being creative or doing things a certain way and they just produce such magic so i feel like i have such a slight hand in it which might just be like have it like trying to create a scenario where they can weave these massive pieces kind of coming up with some visuals that that will work with it Yesterday, the gallery was so frustrated because they kept setting up meetings with me for different metal workers, and I kept meeting them and saying that I wouldn't work with them just because if the vibe doesn't feel right, that it's it's sort of naturally creative. I just the objects never feel right. It is a really tricky thing when you're making unusual things. You have to find people who kind of get it in an easy way. The way I've viewed my role in it has kind of shifted where I feel like I more have to get people on my planet and then let them Mm -hmm. do their thing than what we visualize a designer doing, which is give very specific instructions and micromanage every component. Um, So in the studio, people sort of produce one piece from start to finish themselves. And there's not a lot of assembly line activity like different materials and people will be working on very different things. Um, but I like to have people have full autonomy because then I think they can kind of get onto a, a planet with it and just it, it, things seem to come out in a more special way. Yeah, it's like you're creating the Petri dish and you're putting in the culture, then you're letting things grow organically within it. Yeah, definitely. Which also, it's so funny because objectively, I think it's nicer, but it also feels so exploitative because other people put so much creativity into it, which I think is always the case. I, you know, I, I struggle with that, too, because it's like, well, they're, they're injecting their magic into what goes out into the world with your name on it. So is that exploitative? But if you also didn't trust them or didn't allow them to inject their own magic, you wouldn't really be maximizing their humanity. You'd just be using them for, like, labor. Right. Um, and somehow that and, we feel totally fine with. But Right, but yeah. I don't know that that's okay. <laughs> because I, I think if you go home at the end of the day and you feel ownership and you've really expressed yourself, you you know the terms, right? You're They're working in your studio for work that goes out in the world with with your name on it, but you're all building it together as opposed to you being the galactic overlord who just hands down orders and they have to just fulfill the orders. People want to feel invested in their work. And right now we're talking about the team that you work with as a way of also acknowledging that you don't do it alone. I think a lot of people have this false concept of how art gets made um, or how anything gets made. And it's nice to be able to celebrate the collaboration and the team and the way of working that helps your work become what it is. I agree. With so many of them, people bring in new specialties. And so stuff that I wasn't even aware of or new materials or techniques get introduced. And then it just like keeps adding to the the repertoire. Yeah. I mean, because you're introducing new bacteria into the Petri dish. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) so i want to talk real quickly about this special place where furniture meets art and art meets furniture it's my favorite place in the whole world i guess me too i guess it must be 
Yeah. And I want to know exactly what the depth of what appeals to you about. I mean, I know what appeals to me about it, but this show is about you. So, but I know that there's a very special relationship when you're making a piece that's human scale and you can imagine it in long-term relationship with another user. And it's not even a user. I hate that word, but it's different than audience because they're not going to just view it and not touch it. Even if they don't touch it, even if they treat it like art, because it's in the shape of a cabinet or something else, a mirror, something functional, the relationship is implied. The interactive relationship is implied and it's such a rich space. Yeah. Well, I'm also very curious to hear why you love it, but I mean, I guess to me, there's always been something appealing about how not stoic it is. Like when something's just a sculpture or a painting, it feels like there's always this remove between you and the, the thing. As soon as you can like touch it and use it, it's more of a character in your life. Mm -hmm. It just feels so nice in that regard. I mean, in a weird way, I think you have to care so much about that element because there's so many compromises that you make to play in that playpen. <laughs> you know, there's not a day where you're like, well, this would be harder if it was just sculpture. You know, I think <laughs> right. it's like no one ever says that. <laughs> right. This would be a lot harder to make if it didn't actually have to function or if it didn't have to work. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah, if it yeah. could be any size. Exactly. Well, I think the reasons that you love it and the reasons that I love it are similar. It's definitely be, you can imagine it becoming a character in somebody's life. And when it achieves character status, it's, it's no longer an object. It's, it's a player. It's, um, it's a force. It's, and when there's implied interaction or real interaction, now it's facilitating into interperson interpersonal dynamics in a way. And so it's facilitating connection, even if that connection is provocative even if it's around power dynamics or something that you might not assume is warm and fuzzy, there's still a level of human reflection that has to happen when you're dealing with a piece that's meant to be interacted with by humans. But also as a maker, for me, it was always a way of inviting the person in by saying, look, look, interact with me, open me up, use me. Um, build me into your life, make me a full-time player in, in how you operate, form a, a long-term relationship with me, and don't ever forget me, <laughs> you know? And that was my way of, because I love people, I love humans, so that was my sort of love letter to humans. Yeah, yeah, no, that's really nice. So I want to ask you a couple of personal questions, not that that wasn't personal, um, but I think when you're a creative like such as yourself, it's really, there is no like work-life balance, right? It's all like sort of just intermingled in totally. I, like, sort some of a people, grand think, organic blossom. They're like, my work is about these ecological, ecological systems I've been researching, you know, or like something like yeah. that where you're like, uh, oh, I don't know. No, mine's just about my life. I, I sometimes think about people who are not encouraged culturally um, within their family systems or within society or within their socioeconomic positions. They're not encouraged to express themselves creatively. It just feels like a, a form of starvation to me. <laughs> and I wonder if you've ever thought about like how your existence would be negatively impacted if you didn't have or give yourself the ability, permission, option, or outlet to express yourself creatively. I, it's so hard to imagine. Right? Yeah, I just, you know, when it's like something you've always had. I do think in doing so many projects in places where it's not, it doesn't have a relationship to like a socioeconomic thing, which it certainly doesn't need to, like anyone can be creative with absolutely anything. And I think that there's a lot of privilege that goes with being able to get into the art world proper. Um, mm -hmm. But just being able to be creative, I think, is so within reach and so then it's just like people choosing to culturally make it not a thing which is so crazy like that we would choose to not use our creativity um and it's so hard for me to wrap around wrap my head around why that would be the case but 
I know that that's real. I think so many people as adults find ways to sort of close off their creativity and become more, you know, I think it's a way to like feel more control in your life. If you know how you think, and you know how you feel and you're not being basically surprised by yourself, which I think is what creativity is. We just have to make it okay for everyone. I wholeheartedly agree. There's a vulnerability that has to ride sidecar with creativity. And totally, I think that's one of the reasons a misunderstanding of vulner- vulnerability as a weakness, not a strength, is one of the reasons that it creativity doesn't get supported in certain cultures. And I also think it's one of the things that makes it a fearful thing to embrace within yourself, to own within yourself. I mean, it's probably yeah. just indicative of a whole host of other things, too. <laughs> <laughs> what life lessons are you up against right now that are kind of challenging your personal development, that are making you learn and grow? I think, like, in the past few years, like, learning how to make things at, at the kind of level that they had to be at has been so arduous. And that not only is it visually what I wanted to be and kind of, like, telling the story I wanted to tell and these different materials and ways of making and um, that it also can go on a ship and a truck and a boat and through all these different people's houses and still be exactly the same object is so difficult. And, and most things aren't held to that standard. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think that has been just a huge challenge and I feel like I'm kind of coming out the other side of it. And so now I feel like I'm ready for the next one, which to me is scale. You know, I think I've always sort of suggested that what I was doing was suggestions for architecture and suggestions for like a larger material culture, like a true megalomaniac want to manifest that. (laughs) (laughs) Describe the world if you've been able to have free free reign over everything <laughs> well like those concrete things i've never poured one of them without imagining the building i would make that way yeah. um and you're like yep looks great in my head i would like to see it so i think that there's a lot of things like that where i i can picture how it would scale up and would be really cool to to try and do that I could also see this is, I guess, maybe a suggestion since I'm in your petri dish now. We have been for the last You're hour. Part of it, yeah. <laughs> I could also see certain parts where, like, nature is deliberately allowed to sort of overtake part of the building. Or, yeah, I was talking to the scientist who invented a way to to basically use electricity on metal underwater to to essentially build a a concrete that it draws the calcium out of the water and. Um, sort of built an artificial coral and it was like his suggestion of how to where we could just be building cities this way basically um wow. and i'm wish i had a baby bit of a science brain to to come up with those processes but in lieu of that i feel like i'm really good at pairing the processes with an aesthetic and so i think Diving more in that direction, I, I think, would, is, is sort of the next step for me. And I think it would be a nice challenge. Ooh, I'm excited for that. I think you're right. You get to be gloriously free of the science brain, but you get to still be fascinated by it and pair it with an aesthetic and incorporate it in a way that means you didn't have to go to science school. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> yeah. Like maybe it's all only magical if you have no idea how it works. Uh-oh. maybe what what would you say is your in like if you had a swiss army knife in your pocket and there was one blade that you could pull out that got you out of a jam but it's really a personality trait what do you think about yourself you have that allows you to get out of perilous situations or allows you to get out of your own way which is frequently a problem we always run into I feel like it is a MacGyveriness, um, <laughs> which I think is probably on, on multiple levels, like physical, emotional, like always sort of like, I can patch this together in an unconventional way and make something work. I can see that. And I could see that you're, pro- it's, you're probably the sort of MacGyver of your friend group, too, in terms of like patching things up, helping people understand. I, I like nothing more than when there's a, a group of the most 
seemingly at odds people, like everyone's sort of on a different end of a spectrum. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I do feel like I'll try and curate that from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about, you know, scaling up and in true megalomaniac fashion, designing the world. What do you imagine in terms of designing your life? What's what's 80 year old Misha Khan look back on and feel really proud about? I just don't really think there's like a chance that I'll live to be 80. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's 65. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's like, can we hope for 65? I feel like I was like just peeling out fiberglass, like grinding some metal, <laughs> welding something, sticking my head in the kiln, <laughs> cooking up some aluminum. Yeah. We're just hoping for the best. I don't know. It's so funny. I feel like I'm so immersed in this land of objects. And sometimes I do think about that. I'm like, why don't I do a better job at designing my life? Like just designing systems that would make my life super nice. And in some ways I I do, but, but for the most part, I haven't gotten around to that yet. So maybe that's my next decade. Maybe that's what you can think about on your year of rest and repose. That's right. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, I hope it's soon. <laughs> 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 okay well it sounds like you have um a busy few weeks getting ready for your show i wish you the best um will you give us all the details of that show so we can our listeners can go find it see it in person and maybe look it up um, online yeah it is it, it's soft bodies hard spaces and it opens at friedman benda on february 27th the opening is from six to eight and then the show will be up for six weeks after awesome well, thank you so much for sharing your story with me, with our listeners, for allowing me into your Petri dish. I hope I get to meet you in person when I'm in New York. Likewise. Yeah, please get in touch or come by the studio. Let's get together. A studio visit would be amazing. I think it would blow my mind. Hey, thanks for listening. To see images of Misha's work and read the show notes, click the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app or go to cleverpodcast.com where you can also sign up for our newsletter. Subscribe to Clever on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you would please do us a favor and rate and review, it really does help us a lot. We also love chatting with you on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us at Clever Podcast. You can find me at Amy Devers. Clever is produced by 2VDE Media with editing by Rich Straffolino and music by L1011. Clever is proudly distributed by Design Milk.